I'm continuing my God's Anointed series, and I'm very excited about this one. I'm talking about King David, and I want to talk to those of you who in this season of life feel like you're being overlooked by God and by people because King David was there, but he went on to become one of the most anointed servants of God recorded in all of Scripture. That's what we're addressing here on this edition of Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. Before we get into that, as usual, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get right into this lesson here. It's Stephen Moctezuma. And when the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word that will bless your heart And I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required For you search much deeper within Through the way things appear you're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. Oh, it's all about you. Coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. You know, once God has called you, there's nobody who can stop what God wants to do in your life. And King David is a perfect example of that. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to go through the story of when David was anointed to become the king of Israel. Now, what's interesting is that when David was anointed to become the king of Israel, Saul was still in power. Saul was still in the position of the anointing, but God had already looked beyond Saul and to David Saul didn't know it yet, and I'm not even quite sure that David knew it yet, and definitely nobody around him knew it yet. But let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and there we read the scripture saying, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. The called, number one, are chosen by God. God is the one who chooses you. Now, this is interesting, as I said, because Saul was still in power. And while man might have looked at this situation and thought it odd that someone would be anointed king when there was still a king in power, God had made up his mind. God chose David before anybody else recognized that calling upon his life. It didn't matter who was in power because God 
wanted to anoint David. Nobody could stop what was going to unfold. In fact, it was risky for Samuel the prophet to go and to anoint David while there was still a king in power. He was actually a little bit nervous about going to anoint King David. As we read, continuing in verse number two, but Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. Now, this is point number two, and I want you to really appreciate this because many of us don't recognize this in our own lives. Number two, the called are recipients of legacy. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that before you, there were others in the faith who have gone on to heaven and have gone on to glory. There are those who laid the foundations of our faith and they have passed on this ancient message of the gospel throughout the generations and to you. They have, so to speak, passed the torch to you. I imagine all of those who have gone before me, not just those recorded in scripture, the prophets and the patriarchs and the powerful men and women of God that we see in the Bible, but I'm also talking about those whose names are not mentioned in this book, but whose names are recorded in heaven. I'm talking about the martyrs who laid down their lives for their faith. I'm talking about those who spilled their blood, who gave of themselves, who sacrificed, who lived in difficult circumstances just so that the gospel might reach into certain places. These are the generations that have gone before us. You see, Samuel went to offer a sacrifice to the Lord so that it would not look suspicious when he went in to anoint David. This way Saul wouldn't know what he was doing. But what was happening here was Samuel was taking a risk in making this sacrifice. He was taking a risk in going to anoint David. He himself was putting his life on the line, going and doing what God had told him to do. There are those who have put their lives on the line so that we can stand where we are today. I think of just, for instance, in my own family, you know, I'm a fourth generation spirit filled believer. I'm a third generation minister of the gospel. You go back generations. My family was saved years ago, generations ago. My grandfather is a pastor. My father is a pastor and I am an evangelist. My brother pastors a young adult ministry. My brother-in-law and his wife, my sister, pastor a church in Pasadena. I have uncles and aunts who are all around the globe. I have cousins in Eastern Europe and in Germany. I have family all throughout the States. My grandparents were missionaries to Russia. And I know that the legacy they have passed to me is a blessing. It is a godly heritage. It is something that I have received that is of great value. And you may say, but I'm the first in my family to really serve the Lord, or nobody in my family really loves Jesus like I do. That's okay, because you are the first in the generations that will come after you serving the Lord. You can be the one to plant the seed and found a spiritual heritage. But even if you are still discouraged at the thought that you don't have what some might call a godly heritage, you can look at your brothers and sisters, not just in the scripture, but all throughout church history and know that you are a part of something bigger than yourself. Someone had to sacrifice before you came along. Someone had to take a risk so that the gospel might come to you. Many have gone before you and many will come after you. And this truth helps to ground us. Pray that God gives you the discernment to sacrifice for the next generation when the time comes. And pray that God would give you an appreciation for this legacy that you have received. King David received the anointing from God through Samuel, but Samuel had to take a risk to go and anoint King David. Just in case you ever think that it's just you or that you've done it all on your own or that it's just you and God. Remember, there are those who have sacrificed. There are those who have given their lives. There are those who have spilled their blood that the gospel might be preached, that you would be saved. Generations ago, somebody preached the gospel to someone who then reached you eventually. And I want you to keep this in your mind. And I've heard preachers say that your, your destiny is tied to no one. You know, that's not really true. We say that because often we feel hurt when people disconnect from us. But the truth is that God has tied your destiny to key people. 
Now, this doesn't mean that if they fail in their task of connecting with you in the way that the Lord ordained them to connect with you, that you won't therefore fulfill the call of God. This simply means that God does use people along our journey to help us fulfill the call of God. And Samuel was that person for David. Samuel sacrificed. Samuel took a risk. Samuel went in there knowing that his life was on the line. So that's number two, the called are recipients of a legacy. Do not forget that the gospel that you preach was first preached by the martyrs, was first preached by those who laid down their lives. Do not forget that the gospel first came to you before it could come through you. And know that your obedience is a part of something bigger than yourself and that you are participating in God's global effort to save all of humankind. This is worldwide evangelism. This is the church of the living God, and you get to play a part. So number one, the called are chosen by God. Number two, the called are recipients of a legacy or of legacy. Now let's read verses 4 through 11 where the scripture says, So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemiah. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. Number three, the called will at first be overlooked. You will at first be overlooked. You will at first be counted as useless. Now, Jesse, David's father, did not consider his youngest son worthy of presentation to the prophet for the potential anointing of being the king. Now, if I was David, this would have discouraged me, and I'm sure that there was some discouragement in the heart of David, especially knowing that his father did not think him worthy to present him in such a way. But know this, that even though man may overlook you, God does not. And it may at times seem as though God is overlooking you because you're not getting the, res- the opportunities that you feel need to be coming your way. And this is the truth. God will hide you before he will present you. And this hiding is not a punishment. This hiding is preparation. God is preparing you for something great. God is preparing you for position. God is preparing you for power. But before he can give you that power, before he can give you that position, he has to hide you in the season of preparation. This is to protect you. This is where your motives are tested. The purity of your heart is tested. The faithfulness is tested. This is where God will look at you. This is where God will judge you. And this is where God will decide whether or not to promote you. Others are pushed by man. You may look as one is raised because he's connected to that name or she has this type of talent 
or he was born into that kind of family, or she married into that kind of family. And you can go on looking at all of the people around you and become discouraged because you feel you have much to offer. You feel that there are gifts inside of you that have yet to be used. And you may look around and say, Lord, why that person? Why that person? Why that person? And inside your heart, you may be coming discouraged. But know this, you are not overlooked. You are protected. The purity in your life is developed in the secret place. Purity can only be developed in the secret place. It cannot be developed on a public platform. So God will allow the purity to develop within you in the privacy so that that becomes your foundation for the power and the position that come along later. Now, this is where God really begins to test you because if you're like me, I remember when I first caught this revelation that the Lord will prepare you and hide you before he will expose you as one of his vessels. And really, the truth is it's all progressive. At some point, God will expose you, but it will not always be what you thought it would be. In fact, God will expose you little by little by little by little. He'll promote you little by little by little by little. Many of us imagine that we're going to have what some would deem as the big break. And why you would want that anyway, I don't know. You should just go with God's process. But many want to see a quick work. They want to see it done fast. They want to get to where they deem successful or anything like that that appeals to them. They want it right away. They reach for it. They work for it. They strive for it. They, they're pushy with people. They're pushy with self-promotion and they're trying to get into a position and they won't be able to get into that position. And even if they do, they won't be able to stay long because they didn't go through the preparation. The deeper the roots, the stronger and taller the tree. Many of us want to become known. We want to become seen. We want to become used by God right away because we're impatient, but God is developing those roots. And here's how deceptive we can be even with our own selves. And I, like I was saying, I remember when I had this thought and I realized through revelation of the scripture that God will prepare you in privacy before he will promote you publicly. When I first caught that revelation, I said this to the Lord. I said, okay, Lord, on your timing. And even though I said that, my heart was not in the right place because the only reason I said that is because I was trying to move the process along. It's kind of like parents who know when their child is pretending to be asleep. The child's pretending to be asleep. Why? So the parents leave them alone and they can stay awake. And in this same sense, we do this with God. Okay, Lord, your timing. Okay, Lord, your will. Okay, God, I give you control. And sometimes we only say that because we're trying to rush the process still by pretending we're ready for it. Here's how God knows when you've stopped. When you truly died to yourself, he knows you are ready because you stopped squirming, because you stopped trying to move your way into that position. The called will at first be overlooked and this is a part of the process. This is where God will really begin to work on your heart. This is where God will really test your motives. You want to know where your motives are? Let God hide you and use you at the same time. And that will really tell you where you are. So don't rush this process. Don't try to make it happen faster. Stop saying to yourself that it would be ideal if you could just get to a certain place in ministry right away. That's just not the truth. In fact, there were things that I tried to rush that looking back now, I am so glad I did not rush. And there are things that I tried to take action to rush that I am so glad that God in his wisdom and in his mercy stopped with his own hand my efforts. I used to rebuke that type of stopping, thinking that it was an attack of the enemy. Looking back, I realized much of it was the hand of God. And so I'm telling you today, you don't need a rush. There's no need to rush. You feel an urgency. I understand that. Do what's before you and let promotion come from the Lord. Do what he's called you to do right here, right now. Use what you have right now. And if you're hidden, you're hidden. If you're exposed, you're exposed. Let God do that. And you just do what's before you and promotion will come from the Lord. There's no need to rush it. There's no need to try to persuade God. You may even, here's the, here's the truth. And I'm just going to be honest with you right now. There may be things in your life that cause you to be ambitious. And I, one of the, there's a couple traits I cannot stand. I cannot stand laziness. Ask anybody on my staff, they will tell you. Laziness is my least favorite quality. And I cannot stand ambition. And I can see ambition from a mile away. When I see someone walking up to me, 
I can tell right off the bat whether this person is filled with ambition or not. And they're pushy and self-promoting and they say things that try to they glorify self. And really, the truth is that often we try to rush the process because we're ambitious and we're competitive and we see other people succeeding. So we want to hurry up and succeed so that we are above others. But let the Lord work that out. And the only way he works that out, look, that doesn't mean God doesn't want to use you. He wants to get rid of that. And the only way you'll ever get rid of that is if you're honest with yourself. Until you've got rid of, gotten rid of that ambition, until you've set that aside, until you're honest with yourself and you say, okay, Lord, this is, this is ambition in my heart. Deal with it in me. Only then will he begin to promote you. But until you stop squirming, he will not start moving in your life. He will not promote you. So stop fighting the process. Let him hide you. Let, him, let other people overlook you. You just keep your eyes on Jesus and promotion will come from him. So number four, we're going to get now from verses 12 and 13. Go now to verses 12 and 13, where the scripture says, So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil. He had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now, number four, the called are raised by God. Now, this is different than my first point. Number one, the called are chosen by God. When you're chosen by God, there is potential upon your life. And that potential cannot be stopped so long as you walk in obedience. But number four, the called are raised by God. This is when that potential begins to become fruitful. It begins to manifest itself. And this is where God begins to do his work. David did not have to say, what about me? David did not have to put his hand up and say, well, look at what I do. Look at how well I know the Lord. David did not have to try to put his abilities on display. It was God who sought David out because David was a worshiper, because David was a servant, because David knew the heart of God. And it was that private time with the Lord that eventually raised David to the place where God would put him in power. Now, the called are raised by God. Trust God to do the raising for you. Go down to verses, verse 14. I'm going to read verses 14 through 21. The scripture says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. Isn't that sad? Think about that. He was once anointed by God. That's a whole different message um, for a whole other time. And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. Now, you know what I think? I truly believe that that spirit was not sent upon Saul just for the sake of tormenting him. I believe God was trying to deal with his heart and cause him to repent. I believe, in fact, that Saul, had he stayed right with God, would have handed the throne over to David in a proper way. But that's just a, a, we'll call that a theological theory, and maybe we can explore that some other time. Verse 17, All right, Saul said, Find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wineskin full of wine. Now, that could be a prophetic symbol for new and old wineskins, but we'll continue to read. Verse 21, So David went to Saul and began serving him, Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. Number five, the called must honor their predecessors. Now, I could also make a point on this one verse or this one selection of reading about how the called are servants, but I believe that as we look further into other biblical characters, we will find that trait again because that trait honestly appears in all of them. They're all servants. They all knew what it was to serve. But I want to take the time from this lesson on this 
portion of Scripture to talk about how the called must honor their predecessors. Saul was not right with God, yet David served him. Saul was not right with God, yet David honored him. Why? Because he honored the anointing, not the man. Now, we should honor men as much as they deserve that honor. And the scripture talks about honoring men in power and in leadership. David honored Saul, his predecessor, even though he was his replacement. Now, men of God are not perfect. I often hear, and you know it's so sad, I hear so many of you, and every so often, I don't do it often because I don't have the time, to be honest with you, Every so often, I will go down and I'll look at the YouTube comments and I'll see what people are saying. And some are negative. I just ignore the negative ones. There's nothing worse you can do to someone than ignore their negative comments. We don't respond because it doesn't deserve a response. We don't delete it. Just let them know it's not that impactful. And just ignore it. And that nothing, nothing could drive them crazier. So I enjoy doing that. It's like the, the scripture says, it's like, like kind actions. It's like pouring uh, coals on someone's head. And it's really what, what we're doing is... We're responding to it in a biblical way. Criticism is not something you really need to deal with. But besides the criticism toward me, which I really don't mind, I see a lot of criticism of men of God. And it's so easy. I call them, they're, they're, like, they're like Christian conspiracy theorists. They're like these people who, who go through and look at every ministry that's large or every ministry that's influential, and they just criticize everything. They criticize, well, well, they make too much money. And I say, well, really, well, what dollar amount does the Bible put on a pastor's salary? And they can't tell me that. Or, or they could give that money to the poor. That's what the Pharisees said to the woman who anointed Jesus for burial. You know, when she broke her alabaster box, they were stirred with anger because they said, you could... You can do so much for the poor that way. Regardless, that's not my main point, but that's just a, a thought that I've had. And then they'll criticize the fact that they didn't word something 100% like they wanted it worded. Or they criticize the fact that a preacher is not 100% always preaching the gospel of salvation. Sometimes preachers encourage the saints. Sometimes preachers edify the church. Sometimes preachers talk to the believer about things that apply to them. There's nothing wrong with that. Many of the epistles of Paul do that. We criticize and we criticize and we criticize. And, well, this guy gave a false prophecy or this guy did that. And, you know, there's no grace. There's no forgiveness. We just hold these things over people's heads. And let me tell you something. If you do that, you don't have the grace of God, nor do you understand it. And let that be a rebuke to you. You need to come to the place where you are like David, where even men who make mistakes receive your honor because of the anointing on their lives. You may not agree with everybody, but not everyone who disagrees with you is a heretic. Heretics are those who preach that there's another way to heaven besides Jesus. But if someone is preaching Christ, preaching repentance, preaching salvation, who cares what doctrines you disagree with them on? I mean, Peter and Paul had major disagreements of doctrine. And you read about it in Scripture, yet they were both men of God. They were both saved. They were both spirit-filled. They both contributed to Scripture. We must overlook our differences in the areas that are not fundamental to the faith. And we must learn to honor our predecessors. There are men and women of God who have gone before us, that we must honor even though we don't agree with them. You must honor your pastor even though you don't always agree with your pastor. And I'm not even saying every predecessor is like Saul. I'm just saying Saul was the worst example of a predecessor. Yet David honored him. David served him. man who blatantly disobeyed God was served by David, and it pleased the Lord that David did that. It didn't displease him. I believe that much of what I, I have received from the Lord, much of the blessing I have received from the Lord in ministry is due to the very fact that I honor men who have gone before me. I honor the women who have gone before me. Whether or not people criticize them or whether or not you can nitpick and find little things you don't like or even things you might think is a big deal, still, 
We must be mature believers, and we must honor our predecessors. I'm going to skip down now to verse 23. Actually, let's read verses 22 and 23 where the scripture says, Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. Now, before I go on to the next point, I will, I will just make this point. The Holy Spirit is speaking me to, to share this with you. You notice it was David's service to Saul that positioned him. Just think about that. In verse 23, the scripture says, And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. Number six, the called are worshipers. David knew how to worship the Lord. Nothing pleases God quite like a worshiper. I'm not just talking about those who sing, that's part of it, but those who walk in a constant awareness of His presence and an adoration for His person. Those who sing to the Lord, those who speak to the Lord, those who praise Him, those who are constantly releasing words of adoration, words of praise. Whether you feel like your worship is accomplishing anything or not, whether you feel His presence with you at all times or not, it doesn't matter. Just know that when you are a worshiper, when you are one who is constantly declaring praises and constantly declaring adoration for Christ and constantly speaking of His goodness and talking about how marvelous He is and how majestic He is and how wonderful and how merciful and how loving and how gracious and how patient and how faithful He is. When you're one who constantly sings to the Lord and talks to the Lord and pauses and just says, thank you, Lord, I love you. Or thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Or God, look at what you've built in this earth. Look at what you've created. Lord, thank you for my breath. Thank you for all the life that you've given. And that type of person who is constantly overflowing with this love for God, attracts His presence, attracts His favor, attracts His direction, and attracts His blessing, and all other things of God are attracted to the one who worships. The glory of God rests on that one who worships. And the called must learn to be worshipers. Because let me tell you something. If you're called by God, you're going to go through some hell on earth. I'm just going to be blunt with you, okay? You're going to go through some hell on earth if you're called by God. People will speak evil of you. People will spread rumors about you. Some of you have done it to other men and women of God. And then wait till you are in their position and you find that no matter what you say, there's going to be whole communities against you. And you'll see that it was wrong to do what you did. But I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just trying to wake you up here. You know, and, and we, we, I, I've had people who I thought were with me, they leave. You know, not even Jesus, as great as he was at leadership, was able to keep all his disciples around him. In fact, they all abandoned him when he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane. And so being called by God will attract all of these troubles. Oral Roberts says or said that the healing ministry will attract crowds, controversy, and criticism. I like the crowds. I don't like the controversy. I don't like the criticism. But it's a part of the ministry, especially those who are in spirit-filled ministry. You're going to attract all sorts of criticism. And so when you're called by God, you're going to go through troubles. You're going to go through trials. You're going to have people come against you. You're going to have people challenge every little thing you say where, to where everything you say is taken out of context and everything you say is twisted to make it sound like you're contradicting the word or every mistake where maybe you do get something wrong in Scripture. Every one of those mistakes is going to be magnified. It's okay. Preach the gospel anyway. Be given to the ministry anyway. And you can do that. You can be sustained you can be strengthened. You can keep your peace if you just learn to worship. Before God found me on a platform, He found me in my room. I was an 11-year-old boy in my room just worshiping. And it attracted Him. You will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That's worship. No matter what troubles come your way when you're a worshiper, you're stable. You're emotionally stable. You're mentally stable. You're grounded. Learn to just worship Him. It attracts His presence and His glory. I'm talking about the manifested presence and glory. It, it invites the favor of God into your life. Doors will open for you that will open for nobody else. People will look at you and go, you know, there's just something about you. I don't know what it is. I just, I, I think there's favor on you. And I'm telling you the key to that is worship. So become a worshiper. So again, number one, the called are chosen by God. Number two, the called are recipients of legacy. Number three, 
The called will at first be overlooked. Number four, the called are raised by God. Number five, the called must honor their predecessors. And number six, the called are worshipers. I want to pray with you now. Let's pray that the Lord would speak to your heart and continue to empower you. I hope you're enjoying this series. I enjoy teaching it. We have just a couple more we're going to go through. I am going to bring in some women biblical characters. And I'm praying about whether or not addressing the women in the ministry view. By the way, I fully support women pastors. So if you'd like my thoughts on that, maybe one day I'll do a teaching. It's not really in the, uh, the, the vein or the stream that I flow in when I do my teachings. You know, I like to teach on the call of God, healing, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, prayer, things like that. So as far as theological, doctrinal, technical aspects of scripture I don't always cover. Maybe I'll do a little bit of it in the next edition of Spiritual. Who knows? Either way, I just want you to know where I stand on that. But um, I want to pray with you now. I want to pray that God would continue to empower you, to encourage you, and that you would take what you've learned today and, and just use it and go out and do something with it, okay? So stretch your hands toward mine. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for that one receiving this prayer now. And I pray, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would empower that one receiving this prayer now to fulfill the call that you've placed on his or her life. Fill that one to overflowing. Lord, I pray you strengthen their hand that is put at work to complete the tasks you've given them. I pray, Jesus, we would not waver, we would not doubt, but that we would pursue with clarity of mind and peace of heart the call. I want you to say this, say, Lord Jesus, help me to retain the truth I've received. In Jesus' name. There's somebody watching me right now. Jesus, I, I feel I feel the anointing right now. You're struggling with your weight. And your weight, your physical weight, you're feeling is an is an obstacle to being used by God. You feel great shame. Lord, I pray you help them to become that miracle they've seen themselves becoming. He's going to help you. He's going to help you to lose the weight. I know that's it's odd uh, to randomly talk about this, but you didn't even expect me to say this, but, but God is speaking to you. Begin doing something now, today, and let this be your confirmation that God still wants to use your life. I want you to stretch your hands to remind the anointing is flowing here and the power of God is, is so strong. Lord, I pray, let your healing power flow. Lord, I rebuke diabetes in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for healing of the eyes and the ears. There's a brain disorder is being healed right now. I thank you, Jesus. Asthma has just been healed. Thank you, Lord. Arthritis has just been healed. Thank you, Jesus. The anointing is flowing. Stretch your hands toward mine. Jesus, I give you the glory. There was an um, ear infection. Left ear has just been healed. Thank you, Lord. Your right knee, right knee has just been healed. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody's lower back is being healed right now. Lord, I thank you. A spinal condition is being healed in Jesus' name. A spinal condition that has caused sharp shooting pain. And Lord, I pray you completely make that one whole. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to receive it and say amen. Wow, I sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I want to welcome now, under the anointing, the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. Thank you for joining the Spirit family. We love you, and we are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you want to join the Spirit family, use the information at the bottom of the screen to find out how you can become a member. It's free, and it's basically we send you a weekly email. You can also reply to that email for prayer support, and you're joining the Spirit family. So go ahead and do that today. I want to read your comments now. This is from last week's teaching from our God's Anointed series, and this teaching was on Moses. And so here are the comments. 
Olivia writes, thank you so much, Pastor David, for your teachings. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Stephen, thanks for those spiritual songs. We sing it very loudly in our home. May God bless you all, Spirit Church. We love you. Nothing is impossible with God. That is right. Anita writes, Thank you, Pastor David. What a powerful teaching. I have been so touched by this message. Thank you for bringing this to the light. May God continue to use you mightily and win souls. That's right, Anita. We want to continue to win souls, and that is our ministry passion. Benjamin Porus writes, Thank you so much, Brother David. Every time I listen to your teachings, my faith gets stirred. I love this ministry so much. God bless you more and more. And Benjamin is watching from the Philippines. Another commenter writes, Thank you for this teaching. I am so blessed. Shalom from Indonesia. Sweet E1403 writes, Great message. I was crying at the end because it touched my heart. And Lynn writes, May the Lord take your ministry from strength to strength. Your spirit-led teachings have enriched my soul and have helped me to become a true yielded vessel for God. Bless you and your team praying for you. Well, that really blesses me to know that the teachings have done that for you. And really, it's the teachings can do that for you because the teachings are the Word of God. It's not because of me. It's the Word of God. All the glory belongs to Jesus for every life touch. It's only His power. Only that kind of power that transformed lives can come through Jesus. I mean, it's only through Him. And only Jesus does that. So we give all the glory to Jesus. And I love hearing from you. I love seeing your lives being impacted. And it blesses me. And we want to make a difference even more so. We want to win souls worldwide. Okay? We want to do this on a mass scale. Our channel is growing. The ministry is growing. People are partnering with us. Big things are happening. And I mean big things are happening. And you get to be a part of it. Now, if you remember we're in the middle, don't turn off the video. I want to talk to you. At least hear me out and let the Lord speak to your heart. We are in the middle of a campaign to move into a new ministry facility. And I am so excited about this because this new ministry facility will enable us to do live studio audiences. We'll be doing live broadcasts. We're going to have a 24-7 prayer room. Also, the fundraiser is going to help us to do more events in more places and more often. So I want to come to all the states and all the countries that write to us, but we need the resources to go. So what we want to do is set up these monthly partnerships. And when we get these monthly partnerships, it's going to enable us to do more than ever before. And eventually, as I also promised, we want to start doing translations or, or closed captioning, but in different languages for our YouTube videos so that other people can receive these teachings. But all of this comes progressively. The first step is getting into that new facility moving into that new arena of ministry and doing those events. And that's going to come when we reach a thousand new $30 a month partners. Here's where we are on that campaign. You have responded in a tremendous way, and I can't say thank you enough. There is where we are right now. Look at that. We're almost there. Look at that number. We are almost there. And I want you to be a part of this. Listen, we're so grateful to those of you who have partnered with our ministry. It's blessing others all around the world. And we want to win souls. So this is how you make a difference. You want to really make an impact for the, for the world. You really want to make a difference in the earth. This is how we make that change. This is how we make that impact. It is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. With all the causes out there, there is no greater cause than the gospel. And so help us today become a $30 a month supporter. Become a $30 a month supporter or more, $30 or more a month, and I'm going to send you a signed copy of either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare as our thank you for signing up. Those of you who are partnered, stay signed up with us. We're almost there. And we're going to, I'm telling you, we're not so far from it. It's beginning to accelerate as you can compare from the last few videos. We're almost there. And once we reach that thousand mark, then we're good to go. And we're going to be able to get into, we're going to start looking for that building, get into it renovate it, and then we'll start bringing you guys in for studio audiences. Also, we're going to do weekly meetings. There's so much we can do, but it comes down to this. We need resources to win more souls and expand the kingdom of God. Help us do it today. You've been receiving from these teachings, and you've been wanting to do this in your heart. Just step out in faith. Sign up and do it today. If everyone who watches this right now, if even half of everyone who watches this right now, we, you saw the numbers, we need about 300 new partners. If everybody right now together were to just say, I'm ready, I'm going to do it, and you signed up today, right as soon as you see this, 
then by next week, if everybody did that, we'd reach our goal. So do that today. A link is gonna appear at the end of this video if you're watching this on YouTube. Stick around for that link, click on it, whether you're watching through mobile or on, on, on a desktop, that link will work for you. So stick around until the end of this video and click that link. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.